Hello, and welcome to a slightly more subdued episode of the Dohyo. Today we are going to be talking about the life and too-too-short career of 51st Yokozuna, Tamano Umi Masahiro. Welcome to the Dohyo. Hello and welcome back to the Dojo here on Mr. JWAG's channel. Today, like I said, it's a slightly different sort of episode. We are looking at the life and too, too short career of Tamano Umi, our 51st Yokozuna. Now, this was a story that was new to me, and I realize a lot of you who are very into sumo knew this story before, but uh, those of you who don't know about it, this is one that sort of surprised me. If you just look at the stats of Tamano Umi's career, six total championships, he was only a Yokozuna for 10 tournaments. What is the story there? But then, as I started digging into other episodes, such as like the Yokozuna Kyujo episode and the 40 Club, I started seeing he had these amazing dominant stretches of sumo, and I'm like, why have I never heard about this person? So of course, maybe in May, I had to dive in and try to find every single English language article written about this man. So, a few sumo shoutouts. I could not have put together this episode which deals largely with wrestlers from the 60s and 70s without these two resources. Number one, Sumo Paris. Sumo Paris, uh, they are a YouTube channel that has a lot of classic clips, including many of Taiho, Tamana Umi, and Kitano Fuji, who we are going to be talking about a lot in this episode. And also, uh, a magazine I did not know about. These guys predated me for a few years before I got into sumo. Uh, the Sumo Fan Magazine. This was a magazine that was for fans, by fans. It was edited by a current Chris Sumo YouTuber, Chris Gould. There's a lot of great articles in there, especially about the near past. Its last article online is April 2012. And the last two articles they posted were New Ozeki Kakuryu and Hakuho. Past his peak? So yes, they did an amazing write-up on Tamano Umi back in 2008. I'll be linking it down below if you want to know more. It goes into much more detail than I go into here. But we go into a lot of detail here. Sumo shout -out. Now, one of the greatest things about sport in general is a truly great rivalry. Now, I'm not just talking about uh, what we normally think of a rivalry. Usually we have one really, really awesome person, and then a person who beat them sometimes, like in baseball. It's usually the Yankees, and then the Red Sox have won a few, but the Yankees have won the most. Like in golf, Jack Nicholas and Arnold Palmer weren't really rivals because Jack Nicholas won a lot more. In sumo, most of the great rivalries I've heard about are like Taiho and Kashiwado, and Kitanoumi and Wajima, and when I look at their records, one was clearly better than the other. In fact, in sumo, the last time I can think of when we've had two Yokozuna who were just going at it as pure equals was the very end of the Asashorio era and the very beginning of the Hakuho era. At that point, we really didn't know who was going to win when those two faced off. And for a few years, they ended up splitting a lot of the Yusho between the two of them. Now I bring up rivalry because Tamano Umi is inextricably linked with another rikishi I'm sure you've heard of. Former Yokozuna Kitano Fuji. Now if you are a follower of the NHK Japanese language broadcast, he's been on there for years, he's amazing. Uh, he's been part of sumo culture for years and years and years. When he retired, he was part of the sumo council. Uh, he has been at least four different Oyakata names, <laughs> including Kokonoi, which is the uh, the Chiyo stable, or Chiyo no Fuji's stable. Now Tamano Umi was a bit shorter, he was about two inches shorter than Kita no Fuji, who himself was two inches shorter than Taiho. So in the clips you see, a lot of them are in black and white, and you can't really tell which Mawashi belongs to which, right? Wrestler, so look for the shorter guy, it's going to be Tamano Umi. Tamano Umi and Kita no Fuji were great rivals, they were also great friends. One of the things you're going to notice through a lot of the clips I show, which are mostly Kita no Fuji versus Tamano Umi, is at the end of every match they give themselves a little bit of a check and like, hey, you okay? It's nice. Over the course of their career, when they faced in the regular season and not in playoffs, Kita no Fuji won 24 to 21. So, obviously, a very, very equal match between the two of them. Kita no Fuji, of course, ended up winning 10 Yusho in his entire career to Tamano Umi's 6, but of course, he ended up wrestling for several years afterwards. I only say it's not because we're going to get back to Kita no Fuji, but right now, Tamano Umi. All right, and I just need to say this to make sure we are crystal clear on who I am talking about. Tamano Umi was recruited by a Sekiwake named. Tamano Umi. So, Tamano Umi, when he was coming up the ranks, was called Tamanoshima. So, for ease of everyone's mind, the person we are talking about will always be referred to as Tamano Umi, and the person who recruited him will be called Sekiwake Tamano Umi. Cool? Go. 
Tamano Umi was born in February of 1944 in Osaka. At that time, there was, of course, a lot of bombings going on in World War II, so they moved to Aichi Prefecture, which is about halfway between Osaka and Tokyo. He grew up there excelling at judo, and he was then noticed by Sekiwake Tamano Umi and was asked to join their beya. Now, his mom was against this idea, and so, and frankly, was Tamano Umi at that point, because he was worried, his mom being a single mom, that she was not going to be taken care of were he to join the sort of sumo monk life. So, Tamano Umi was actually adopted by a friend of his junior high principal, so that way his mom would be taken care of if he went into sumo. And that just... That's just such an above and beyond sort of thing. You wouldn't see that in American sports. Like, Nick Saban would have, like, 45 giant children. So, fresh out of junior high, he had his Maezumo seeding tournament right after turning 15. So this is another one of those cases where he was very much a sumo lifer. And we're going to be talking about 12 years of a career, so you're going to be like, I thought this guy died young. Well, yes, but he also started very, very early. Now, as I said before, Tom Umi was a shorter wrestler. He was around 5 foot 9, 5 foot 10. Uh, I guess about Haramafuji shaped and sized is how you would describe him. So he spent about three years in the lower division sort of finding his footing and working his way slowly up. He ended up getting stuck in Makushita for a while. Then, in 1961, Seki Wake Umi ended up retiring, getting his elder stock, and becoming Oyakata Kata Onami. Now, Kata Onami, the Seki Wake Tamanomi, had thought that there was a deal between him and Nisho no Seki, his current Oyakata, that he could leave with the rikishi that he himself had recruited. So Kata Onami ended up just splitting off on his own and taking a bunch of wrestlers with him, including the future Tamanomi. So Nisho no Seki submitted the retirement of the nine wrestlers who had followed Kata Onami to the other stable, including one of them was Tamanomi. This took a year to resolve. No one ended up being forced to retire, but as you can imagine, this could not have been good for the focus of young Tamano Umi. Then in 1962, the split was made final, and then Tamano Umi started to get a bit more traction in his career. By the end of 1963, he made his Jurio debut at Jurio 18, a rank we don't even have anymore. And he made his Jurio debut exactly one rank underneath Kitano Fuji. Even though Kitano Fuji was two years older than Tamanoshima and entered sumo two years earlier, Kitano Fuji ended up getting stuck in Sandanmei, but they ended up starting Sekitori status and Makauchi status uh, one tournament apart. Kitano Fuji making his debut in January of 64 and Tamanomi making his in March of the same year. And the crazy thing about Tamano Umi's Makauchi debut is that when he made it, like I said, it was one after Kitano Fuji, but Kitano Fuji had already made it to the Sanyaku. What? Let me know in the comments, has any of you ever seen a bigger jump than Kita no Fuji going from Maigashira 10 East to Komasubi East in one tournament? It took Tamano Umi a little bit longer to make Sanyaku, but his very first match at Komasubi came on day one of January 65 against Dai Yokozuna Taiho. And yes, he surprised him, and it was an amazing match, but he ended up getting a 5 and 10 that tournament, and ended up, in his career, losing uh, more than 80% of his matches to Taiho. But from that point on, Kita no Fuji and Tamano Umi were in the Sanyaku more often than not for the rest of their careers. Then in 1966, we ended up at a time in Sumo where we were starting to lose out on our upper Sanyaku, a very, very thin time. We only had one Ozeki at the time, whose name, coincidentally, was Yutakiyama, no relation. And Kitano Fuji and Tamano Umi made Ozeki in consecutive tournaments. Quick sidebar. Now, we've been talking a lot about Ozeki runs in the past year, because we've had two great ones and a few unsuccessful ones by Mataki Umi alone. And we keep going back to the idea that it's supposed to be uh, you're averaging 11 wins over three tournaments, so 33 over three. Well, turns out, uh, when your soul Ozeki is getting hurt a lot, maybe you want to push people up a little bit faster. Sometimes you'll let people become an Ozeki with 28 wins. Yes, 28 wins. Kita no Fuji and Tamano Umi were both promoted to Ozeki having 28 wins in the ring. Tamano Umi ended up getting two Fusen wins, so his win total was 30, but nowhere near the 33 they've been telling us is the Ozeki standard. So let's just remember this when we start talking about Ozeki standards and Yokozuna standards in the following year. 28, 
Quick sidebar. Now, a lot of you are probably saying, it's like, yeah, that's really weird that they'd be promoted that fast. They must have not done very well at Ozeki. Well, you'd be right for the first year or so. Kitano Fuji ended up winning a Yusho in 67, but then not winning his second for quite a while. Tamano Umi, in his first year at Ozeki, never even broke double-digit wins. But then, in November of 1967, Tamano Umi started going on a tear. A tear of 10 consecutive basho of 10-plus wins. And during that time, he got his first Yusho win and five June Yusho, starting to push his way up to what we might consider a Yokozuna run. But not quite yet. But again, there were naysayers. Uh, he didn't really have a full Ozeki run. He hasn't been a dominant Ozeki for long enough. It had been a couple years at that point. But he didn't beat any Yokozuna in that tournament. But he did manage to beat all the other Ozeki on days 13, 14, and 15. Including this match against his old buddy, Kitano Fuji. Now, at the end of 1969, Tamano Umi started morphing into what I like to call Boss Tamano Umi. Tamano Umi's second Yusho was in September of 1969, and he made this one to remember. Was there a Yokozuna there? Oh, yeah. And did he beat him? Yes, he did. He beat Taiho for the first time in four years to clinch that Basho. And then people started to want to take him seriously. Is there a Yokozuna run in his future? Who's going to get it first, him or Kitano Fuji? Well, then came 1970. Now, January 1970 came down to the very final day. Tamano Umi and Kitano Fuji. Tamano Umi was one behind and needed to beat Kitano Fuji twice to win the tournament. Here's what happened. Now this created a very interesting situation, because we had Taiho, who was getting a bit up there in age, no other Yokozuna at the time, and two young, awesome Ozeki, who may or may not be quite ready for the Yokozuna belt. Well, Kitano Fuji at that point had now met the standard. That was his second consecutive Yusho, having also won in November of the previous year, and Jun Yusho in September. So he had what you'd call, I guess, a legit Yokozuna run. But Tamano Umi at that point, he had won two, but he hadn't won two in a row. And going into this tournament, well, he had that Taiho beating one, then he had a 10 and 5, and then ended up losing in the playoff we just saw. Well the JSA ended up promoting both of them at the same time to Yokozuna. Like, I don't know how, it's, like, how you can rival any harder than that. <laughs> and it was at that point that Tamano Umi became Tamano Umi. So now the name is correct from here on out. So starting in March 1970, Tamano Umi started a 10 basho tear. In those 10 basho, he ended up winning 130, losing 20, averaging out 13 and 2. He ended up picking up four more Yusho, and five Jun Yusho. In fact, during Tamano Umi's Yokozuna tenure, the only three people to win tournaments at all were himself, Kitano Fuji, and Taiho winning two, Kitano Fuji winning four. But as we are seeing now with Hakuho, even the greatest sumo wrestlers can't beat time forever. Taiho's last full basho was March 1971, and on day 15, he faced Tamano Umi for the title. The very next tournament, Taiho went in Tai, and bestowed the honor of being a part of his retirement ceremony to the other Yokozuna, Kitano Fuji and Tamano Umi, which of course they both enthusiastically accepted. In the tournament after, July 1971, Tamano Umi put together his very first and only Zensho Yusho. Quick sidebar. Before anyone thinks that, oh, well, Taiho was gone, so that one doesn't really count as a Zensho, it absolutely counts. Uh, he had just beaten Taiho the tournament before. 
All right, let's take a look at that Banzake. So Taiho was missing, but we had three future Yokozuna. We had three future Ozeki. And we also had two Sekiwake who were going to win championships the following year following the untimely death of Tamanoomi, Hasegawa and Takamiyama. And now Takamiyama, of course, was the very first American to join Sumo with any degree of success. He was the first foreign-born Rikishi to win a tournament, but this is also, of course, like, we, we need to get back to Tamanoomi. But point is, there was a lot of talent in this Banzuke other than Taiho. And Kita no Fuji, the other Yokozuna, was there too and fought all 15 days. And this was day 15. So it was at this point where apparently Tamano Umi started feeling bad. Uh, he knew in July of that year that he was going to need his appendix out at some point, but he kept pushing it off. Now at this point, it is very, very easy to try to get in the head of this person. It's like, well, now knowing what we know, why didn't he just get the surgery? I guess it's very, very difficult when you are a younger person who has made a living of their body being invincible to have any concept of the idea <laughs> that your body can be vincible or that your body can fail. Uh, I mean, he may have never had that happen before. And then unfortunately it happened at exactly the wrong time. So in September of that year, he entered the tournament, fought all 15 days, taking a lot of painkillers evidently, and fought one more match on day 15 with his friend. Tamanoomi waited until after Taiho's retirement ceremony on October 2nd, 1971, and immediately entered the hospital, and he never left. Tamanoomi died on October 11th, 1971, by pulmonary embolism related to complications from appendectomy surgery. He was the first active Yokozuna to pass away since 1938, when Yokozuna Tamanishiki passed away because he delayed an appendectomy. Now, I'm not a judging kind of person, but were I a Yokozuna now, two points make a line, and I wouldn't want to be the third point in that line. Now, the story, of course, doesn't end here. This is one of the things about sumo wrestling. Like, even when the story of one wrestler ends, it keeps flowing back into the river of sumo that just keeps flowing. So, Kitano Fuji, now facing the sport without his best friend and chief rival, ended up winning the following tournament, but clearly something was not right. Uh, for most of 1972, Kitano Fuji went Kyujo. He ended up taking a whole tournament going Kyujo and then got caught going to Hawaii trying to clear his head. Point is, like, things got a little messed up. And we always know that I do love a oh, what if. What could have possibly happened to sumo history if Tamano Umi had been able to stay healthy. But as we have found out in previous episodes, uh, Yokozuna tend to retire around 30-31, so if he had had four more years of his peak, what would have happened? Well, I mean, I think Kita no Fuji probably would have ended up winning about the same number of tournaments, considering uh, I think it cost him a few tournaments not having his friend and rival there. But if you start looking at those people I mentioned, Hasegawa, Takemiyama, uh, and also uh, Ozeki Kotozakura, possibly Kotozakura would never have made Yokozuna had Tamanoumi been there. And probably we would end up taking one or two Yusho away from Wajima as well. Kitanoumi seems to have started his career a bit farther along, and I don't think there would have been as much overlap. So, why now? Why is this a thing I want to bring up right now? Well, we seem to be approaching a time in sumo very rapidly where a giant alpha dog is about to retire and we're not exactly sure if there's anyone up to the challenge of replacing him. Right now we have two young Ozeki, two years apart, one who's a little shorter and very, very intense, and one who's a little taller and more popular. And the young guy's even gone through a stable change with a whole lot of drama. So are we entering an age of sumo where there might be two equals at the top of the Banzagei? 
Thank you so much for coming back to the Dohyo and watching the episode. Thank you for your patience on this one. Uh, when you're telling the tale of uh, a tragic death in sumo, you want to make sure you take the time to do the research and you want to do it right. So everyone, stay safe, stay strong, stay healthy, and I will see you all next time on the Dohyo.